My name is Shadil Muhtar. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm actually in the geotech group, so I um, come with a slightly different background than most of the other speakers here. Um, I, most of the work presented here was done by Antonis Alvertis, who's a graduate student who just graduated, actually. Well, we're leaving here tomorrow morning, so we can make it in time for his graduation. So, uh, and uh, I'll be talking about some of the lab scale assessment for apl application of fluorosorb for in-situ soil stabilization for PFAS uh, treatment or containment. Um, presentation is going to be relatively simple outline. We're just going to have a quick introduction, uh, which I promise you will not have any details about PFAS because you all know about much more about that than I do. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, case study soil characterization, and then how we did the in-situ soil stabilization uh, simulation and the performance of the in-situ soil stabilization. So uh, to get us started, um, you know, we all know PFAS gets in the ground mostly through the uh, firefighting foaming agents and give us this big hot spots with very, very high concentrations of contaminants. And then we have all kinds of mechanisms that make that PFAS go all over the place, giving us all kinds of problems and headaches. And right now, the most way we deal with it is through water treatment. Uh, pump and treat, treating water to get it to the standards or the regulations that we have. Um, and that's really good and very important, and we must do it because the water is contaminated and it's going to reach the consumer right away if we don't do something about it. But to start looking a little bit further ahead, is this the best way to handle the situation? Is it the best way to keep doing this for, for till PFAS is going to run out? That's going to take a long time, and that's going to be a lot of changing vessels and redoing things and maintenance and operation costs. And the idea with what we're trying to do basically is say, well, why are we going to keep doing it the way we're doing it right now? Why don't we try to go to this area over here and maybe try to figure out where we can stop the PFAS from going away, spreading out instead of just letting it spread out and then treat it at the end, at the downstream? What if we go there and just encapsulate it all in its place and reduce how much actually or minimize what's coming out of it? Then we're going to save ourselves a lot of operational costs. It's going to be a one-time, hopefully, fix that's going to uh, save us from all the trouble we're going through right now. The other alternative, of course, would be maybe we can just contain it. Or maybe containing it could be a temporary solution till we figure out how we deal with the hot spot as is and prevent it from spreading uh, around. So how can we take advantage of some of the advanced, different advanced methodologies for soil stabilization that are being right now more utilized for strengthening and water control in a geotechnical applications and try to take those and apply them more for PFAS contamination in the ground. And so the rest of my introduction is going to focus, just give you a little bit of background of those different methods, since many of you come from the environmental side, not the geotech side. And uh, how many of you are actually practicing geotechnical engineers? All right, fantastic. So hope those, sides, those slides won't be, will be perfectly positioned for you guys just to get everyone on board uh, on the same uh, uh, level in terms of what are the different options and how can we go and do this tub, basically, around a contaminated soil uh, with, while, we're, while it's after it's already, bit, it's already there. So some of the things to consider when we're going to look at our in-situ soil stabilizations, first and most important is try to understand our in-situ conditions. What is our soil type? What's the contamination we have? Level of contamination? What's the groundwater conditions? Are we having gro flowing groundwater? Are we in a dry spot above the groundwater table? And are we going to look at a mass treatment to stabilize the whole thing? Or are we going to actually look at creating those containment cutoffs around it to hold everything in place, but not particularly stabilize everything at that particular time? And those could be, you know, time dependent and you could go start with the containment and then go go mass treatment because it's much faster to do 
the surrounding and keep everything lo local, then take your time to treat everything. Um, and that takes us to two other questions that we need to address. First is, what kind of in-situ soil stabilization material are we going to use? And the second one is, how are we going to take that material and actually get it into the ground? Particularly if we're talking about those cut-off walls or even creating a whole tub to contain everything, how can we take our material and create those in-situ um, uh, barrier elements to contain our uh, containment in place? So when we look at the material we need to use, we obviously are going to need our sorbent material, our fluorosorb, uh, or uh, whatever the sorbent material we're going to use. We're going to see how the fluorosorb did today. Uh, we can apply that dry or as a slurry. We're going to talk about that quite a little bit later, about the importance of doing it one versus the other. And we're going to see basically most likely, we're going to need to add some kind of additives to control the rheology and the stability of those materials so we can actually deliver them to the ground in an effective and uh, homogeneous way so we can have reliable uh, treatment. There's different ways where we can apply those in the ground. We can look at permeation grouting. We're going to look at soil mixing and jet grouting. So I'm going to just uh, spend a couple of minutes on each one of those before we get into some of the results that we obtained. But keep in mind, all those three are not independent or sequential points. You're going to need to uh, understand the institute conditions, and that's going to control your materials, uh, but it's also going to control the IS applications, and the material itself are going to control the applications, and there's basically a loop here, a continuous loop in the decision making that everything has to be accounted for together to be able to come with a successful uh, solution. If you just think about the soil type, and if you look, keep it very simple and look at just particle size distribution, the simplest thing we can do to characterize our soil, that alone can control what kind of sorbents you could use. If you look at it from a more grouting geotechnical application point of view, this is one of a very, a very commonly used chart, which tells us basically based on the soil gradation that you have, what kind of particles you could inject into the soil. And as you can imagine, when you go from coarser granular material, you can inject things as cement and bentonite, but when you start getting into a finer material, then you have to start going with more fluid kind of injections. You can't actually inject any more solids. So that kind of controls the particle size of the sorbent that you can permeate into those medium. Uh, at least for permeation grouting, right? So that's where we said the sorbent and the application methods, they're all kind of interconnected and you can't make decision of one versus the other independently. Um, the type of soil can control the different methods and we could apply it. Some soils are more, um, uh, allow us better to do permeation groutings, some others allow us to do jet grouting, some are good for deep mixing and others are not good for anyone, and then you have to go to something completely different. Um, the groundwater is particularly biggest impact on whether we're going to be able to apply our in-situ stabilization dry or wet. And what I mean by dry or wet is, are we taking, let's say, our fluorosorb as a powder or our cement as a powder and try to mix it into the ground? Or are we creating a slurry, a grout, a drilling, a mud? and then injecting that and mixing it. And while at most of the time that's not a big deal, when we start looking at doing those kind of applications for trying to stabilize and contain contaminants, this becomes a huge issue because the amount of material we're putting into the ground is proportional to the amount of um, uh, material that's going to be uh, coming out at the end that is excess material that you have to actually deal with it, right? So maintaining or being able to minimize how much uh, soil is going to be or how much uh, material is going to come up out of your drilling, uh, out of your mixing, is going to be very important because that material, usually we can handle it uh, regardless of its size, but when it starts to have PFAS in it, now you're going to have to answer the question, where are we going to get rid of this material, right? So 
being able to understand what kind of conditions and what kind of mixing or what kind of injection you could use that allows you preferably to do it dry because when you're doing it dry, you're inputting the least amount of material into the ground as compared to just adding water and what's coming out is contaminated material. So you're gonna minimize how much spoils are coming out from your process and minimize how much you have uh, surface material that you need to take care of uh, later on. Uh, obviously, if you have flowing water versus uh, static groundwater, that's gonna affect the mechanisms of the PFAS transfer. It's gonna affect how you're gonna treat it. Um, and that could impact whether you're gonna do mass treatment versus containment. Uh, when we talk about mass, versus, mass treatment versus containment, there's many factors that we could take into account, like level of contamination, potential risk to the surrounding, and that con gonna control the different I methods that we could do our in-situ soil stabilization. And that's gonna take me to the last point I'm gonna mention here, which is the different ways that we could apply our in-situ soil stabilization. Probably most common one that, I'm guessing most of you have dealt with at some point is the soil mixing but that's not really the only way and it might not be the most, um, it's still a very good way for some application, but we have other ways that we could do. The least disruptive is our uh, permeation grouting. So you're basically drilling small holes, you're inserting your tuba mochetta inside, which basically have those sleeves that when you push the grout in here under pressure, those sleeves open up and inject the grout, it permeates the medium and you can actually basically deliver your material inside uh, underground at the different locations. Um, you don't have to go all the way from the surface down. You could go treat at different depths at different locations without having to treat all the way from the top to the bottom. The biggest, ad so this is a really good application for uh, mass treatment. You could still use it for containment, for creating cutoff walls, but it's really much more useful for mass treatment. Um, for those kind of applications, the rheology of the mix becomes very critical because you need to have a stable grout, right? You all are environmental engineers and deal with tre waste tre with treatment. We, we like beds because they do filtration for us, right? And what we're doing in permeation grouting is going against the nature of suspensions flowing through porous media. We're creating those very dirty water with three, five percent, six percent by weight of solids. And those are larger particle solids. And we're trying to push them through a porous media. And we want to make that, that dirty water go through without leaving anything retained in the porous media, right? It's, we're trying to prevent the porous media from doing what it's meant to do. So, that takes a lot of work onto the design uh, of the mix itself, the rheology and the stability of the mix to make that happen. Uh, it's very applicable for more porous, permeable medias. Um, and one of the biggest advantages is very effective to do it near structures. And most of our very hot spots are right next to structures where training facilities, uh, military bases, where there's actually existing structures where disturbing the f near the foundations of them with excessive soil mixing might not be a very feasible option. So those kind of things would be helpful from that aspect. Soil mixing is the one that most of you are most familiar with probably. It require, it's basically a process of mechanical mixing. We could have some rotary vertical axes and you're gonna see them looking like this once in the lifetime of a machine. You're gonna see them more looking like this most of the time. Um, you could have uh, more of a horizontal rota rotary axis. Um, again, it looks more something like this. Um, or you could have those continuous trench cutting uh, equipment. Biggest advantage of those ones is you're actually doing mechanical mixing. You know you're mixing everything together. You're forcing everything to be mixed together. So you have a little bit more confident in the homogeneity of the final product because you're physically doing the mixing as you go. Um, but, uh, so those are really good for mass treatment 
not necessarily the trench. Cutting is more for kind of the, our containment system. Our cutoffs are more applicable, but the vertical and the horizontal rotary axes, we could use them for mass treatment, but they're really effective for containment, for creating those vertical cutoffs around to contain our uh, site, our hotspots. Um, or really to stop a plume from propagating any further. It doesn't have to be right at the hotspot, right? Um, we could do those dry or wet as compared to the permeation grouting, which has to be done wet because you have to create that mix to permeate it. So this gives us a big advantage in terms of the amount of spoils coming out from the ground. Um, but its biggest disadvantage is that it needs a massive amount of head, room, headroom to be able to have those big booms going down to the ground and doing the mixing because it is counting on the mechanical mixing to be do it. So it's not as easy to make, the, to apply those kind of things in uh, tight places where you have limited space. Last one I'm gonna talk about is jet grouting. And this is kind of the most uh, diverse, most applicable to different situations. Uh, it requires very highly specialized equipment, but uh, you have very powerful jets going at multiple thousand PSIs, injecting the, injecting the water out, uh, or the grout, or different combinations of. And the idea is we're counting on the pressure coming out of the water and the grout to create the mixing itself. So you no longer have to insert large diameter mixers to go underground to create the mixing. You could actually go down with a, an inch or two inch rod uh, into the ground and create the mixing. In, so under the ground you have the th that you're, you're drilling at the beginning and then inserting your, uh, your jets and doing this, uh, the spinning. Um, and then you create basically your columns. Um, and those things right now, we could actually go into basements of buildings and go tens, and, uh, tens of feet underground, even with very controlled, very limited headroom and things like that. So very, very effective solution. Um, that we could use. We have different ways and different means to mix and create the, either the early water uh, uh, air systems or, uh, followed by the grout or a one-time system depending on the type of soil. So it's applicable to a very wide range of material that we could apply those things to. And those allows us to go down here and create a series of them at the bottom without treating anything at the top. So when you talk about creating that bottom base of the tub, we can do things like this with those kind of equipment with drilling very small holes. Each one of those holes could create up to a seven meter diameter treated soil based on the pressures that you're applying in your equipment. So they could be a very effective way to mass treat uh, without having major disturbance on the soil that you might be having problematic ways with. Um, so those are very, very effective way um, we over, always have them overlap because since we're not using actual mechanical mixing, we don't have 100% control over the diameter. And depending on the different types of soils, we can have much more or much less control over the diameter. But we always have them, when we're doing the final design, we have them all overlapping enough to make sure that we have continuous coverage when we're doing this. Um, so. Those could be applied for both mass treatment or, contaminant or containment application. And one of the really cool things here is that we could use them as create full cylinders or partials. So as this one is spinning around to create those massive columns, if you're trying to create a cutoff wall, what we'll do is we'll make the jet go 30 de 15 degrees back, 15 degrees forward, and you create those fans that become a wall. And then you have those ones go around and you create a much a smaller cutoff wall than having a full-blown uh, diameter. And think about that in terms of when you're considering the amount, not necessarily the amount of material you're putting in, because on the grand scheme of things, that might not be a very big cost. But think in terms of how much, the fact that you're using less material and there's less spoils coming out, and there's less contaminated soil that you have to deal with at the surface. So you could be very creative in how you design those things so that you could put in just as much as you need to, but not overdo it. 
Um, we said that they can be done in a constrained environment. You could do them in the basements of a building. You could do them around buildings. And because you're not doing a mechanical erosion, you could have those things adjacent to buried structures and adjust water pressure going, hitting the adjacent structure and, not, and just go around as compared to mechanical mixing where you can't actually get too close to the structure because you're going to hit it. So you could create a sealed treatment that's touching an adjacent structure. And that's why jet grouting is becoming a very, very common way to do groundwater control when you're doing deep excavations and things like that, when we're not necessarily talking about contamination, but just water control in general. All right, so that's kind of just give you a background of where we think this all could go eventually. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, microphone's coming your way right away. Man, I've never seen a man move so nimbly and gently around tight spots like this. Fantastic. <laughs> so, so the jack rotting, the spot, like I, I contact several jack rotting contractors. They all told me that you will have a 30 to 40% subsurface total volume come out of the sp sp spot. Spoils. It, spoils, yes. yes. Is, is that true for jack rotting? For jet grouting, you're going to have more spoils coming out, yes. Uh, it's, you're injecting. It's a wet injection method, right? So you're actually creating your, the grout that's being injected is actually a slurry. So mm -hmm. you have what, let's say you're using fluorosorb. You're going to mix it with some water to create a slurry. And that slurry is going to be injected down into the ground. Now, the amount of spoil coming out is going to depend on the concentration of your slurry, the, the, how much treatment are you doing full circles or are you doing those fans. But it's also going to depend on your groundwater conditions down below. So if you're doing this where you're above the groundwater table, then the amount of spoils coming out is going to be much less because your water is actually filling the space there. If you're doing it under the groundwater table where everything is saturated, in theory, anything you're going to inject in is going to come back out because there's no extra space to create down. Right? So, uh, so it, it, you could have larger spoils depending on the application and the underground conditions. And that's something that definitely we've been trying to mention that the spoils are going to be one of the things that we need to be, need to be prepared to handle when we're doing things like this. Any other questions before we move on into the details of the case study? All right. So first we're going to talk a little bit about our soil characterizations. Then we're going to jump into the in-situ soil stabilization simulation and then and how did that perform at the lab scale? And then just very quick final thoughts at the end. Uh, so soils were obtained from a hot spot at the military base, um, and they were homogenized or, uh, or at Setco here and then shipped to us in HDP buckets, and that's where we started playing around with them in the labs. Um, initial characterization, typical grain size distribution, um, we did some compaction tests. They're, kind of, they're more on the sandy side, so really the compaction was more, we're trying to see if we can ever create monoloths out of them, so we could do the 1315 later on. Turned out we can't, but it was worth a try. Uh, the water content which they got shipped was about 1%. We tried to look at different water contents here, and one of the things that we end up looking at is we compacted all our specimen over in this range somewhere between 11 to 14 percent or 15 percent range. So that number is going to come back up a little bit later. The pH of the soil as it came was somewhere between 7.3 and 8. And next thing we wanted to characterize the contamination of the soil. So we used the, um, we took samples from the different buckets to try to make sure that later on when we take soils from the different buckets we have same starting baseline. And the samples were uh, we tested the samples using the LEAF method 1313 with modifications of the equipment we're using and things like that to account for the PFAS specifics or using um, HDPE bottles and no Teflon, no sieving, uh, uh, all that things uh, to avoid any potential cross-contamination to our samples. The method was basically taking 40 grams of the, four, of the soil that's finer than 2 millimeter um, and when I say no sieving, I meant before we do the analytical testing on the effluent, not actually here to get the particles to be less than two millimeters. Uh, then they were put in a 500 milliliter uh, 
uh, HDB bottle that was filled with 400 milliliter of reagent grade water, agitated for 40 hour top over bottom. And uh, what you don't see here is Antonis was on the, on the side actually cranking this all night long. So he, he, he had a much smaller upper body when he first joined grad school and now he's all buffed up. Uh, but we didn't charge him any fees for that. Uh, then take the samples out, centrifuge, uh, and send actually the uh, final effluent to Colorado School of Mines. Eric did an excellent job talking about how they did their testing there. So we're just going to say we send them to them, and they tested them for us and send us our uh, concentrations. And so when we first start first looking at the soil, um, the test is for the 32 different analytes, and um, not going to expect you to read all of them, but we basically we characterize them into different chemical groups, and we're going to come back to that in a second. Uh, those are all the different 32 ones that we looked at. And the first thing was to see how much we have, or what do we have in our soil. And this was the first uh, data that we got, and those were, I think, averages from eight samples from different locations within the three buckets that we actually tested. And what we notice is that, uh, well, first couple of baselines for in this graph to help us see where things are. This is the upper limits of our quantif quantification, uh, lower limit of our quantification, and that's the 70 PPT, as our health advisory. And you notice that we have few analytes of very high interest for us that had very high peaks. Um, the PFOA, FOSA, PFOS, and the PFHX. Uh, so we definitely wanted to look at much more details up for those four analytes. Uh, then we looked at other th other analytes of might be of interest, and we grouped uh, the fir the first three in the light red that shows pink here, and uh, the three in the middle. We looked at the PFBS because it was one of our shorter carbon ones, uh, we kept it even though it was already in the soil alone at the health advisory limit, but we wanted to point to keep track of that, then the 6.2 and the 8.2 FTSs at the end. So anything that's inside the reds were combined together and treated as one, because we didn't have high enough concentrations of them, but we wanted to keep track of it. Uh, so we'll be presenting data in terms of the eight different groups, as well as the total PFAS of all 32. Uh, but we're not going to focus on each one, just those eight uh, individually. Uh, so that's what we know now what we have in our soil. So we're going to try to simulate the in-situ soil stabilization. Since our soil was really dry, we actually decided we're going to simulate wet mixing in the ground because we won't be able to do dry mixing with such wet so with dry soils. So first thing we did is we took the, our fluorosorb and the OPC and make, mix them with water using high shear mixing to create the grout that we would actually use in the field for our mixing. Uh, the grout concentrations were determined so that the total amount of water we added and the uh, fluorosorb and OPC would give us a final soil mixtures in the 10 to 15% moisture content range. And all the OPC and filtrosorb concentrations you're going to see in these presentations are percentages by dry weight of the filter sorb to the soil. So we're doing, taking dry uh, filter sorb or dry OPC to the dry solids of the soil, not the total weight of the soil. Uh, the soil mixing, we took our natural soil, put it in this very highly specialized mixing equipment. It might look familiar to you, but don't let your eyes deceive you. This is a very, very highly specialized piece of equipment that you cannot actually get hold of any place. Turned out that we had it in the lab and it's stainless steel, so it seemed like a good way to go. And uh, so we're mixing, we put the soil in here first. The grouts are being mixed over here. We take one container at a time and add it uh, as we're mixing. And um, uh, the rest of the... Grouts were actually agitated all the time to make sure we don't get any sedimentation. And when we're pouring them, they're all homogeneous and everything is being mixed nicely together. And those are the different mixes that we have. Uh, Antonis loves colors, so he, throughout all his work and his thesis, every single mix had a color that was kept throughout the whole thesis. So we had our natural soil at the beginning, uh, 
and then we had 1% cement, 3, 5, 8, 10% cement, and we have different percentage of fluorosorb between 1 and 5% for the different mixes that we tried. And I think we had, yeah, uh, we had one at, uh, do we have one at 8 here? Yeah. So, um, we, after we mix the soil, we compact it in 2 by 4 uh, malts, put it in a humid room for 28 days to, test, to determine its strength, uh, like standard testing for anything with the cement. And then when we took those for testing, we did different kind of testing. First, we did unconfined compressive strength test. We did some hydraulic conductivity tests. And we did the, uh, yes, the leaf method 1315 on the monoloth. So in the 1315 is when we take the monoloth, put it on a stand, put it in different tubs, and have wa fresh, fresh water, as in uh, raging grade water, but we're taking it from one, w one tub to the other over time. Talk about that in a minute. Uh, but then the samples that we tested for strength, we actually took those, the pieces that broke them from there, crushed them, sieved them through s uh, less than two millimeter, and then took samples of those and ran the 1313 and 1316s on them. Um, and what we did at the beginning is actually within each specimen, we took samples from the top, middle, and bottom location from, multi from up to eight samples, uh, eight specimens that we broke to make sure there's no non-uniformities within the specimens. And we did not find any statistical difference between the samples, so we figured out we could take one sample from the remaining tests and we should get, be good enough to go. Um, so we took the samples that broke out, we ran on them the 1316 at L over S of 2510, and then we did the th method 1313. We didn't get around to do it at different pHs, so we just did it at the actual t mixed pH. So natural soil was at natural pH. Soils with cement were at a higher pH because of the cement. We didn't run tests with modified pH. And this looks nicer in reality, really. The 1313 is the same one as the 1316 at L over S of 10. So it double counts as twice uh, because it's the same test. Uh, and then we did the pH measurements for everything it's doing. So how did the soils perform? Well, we had initially with no, with our soil was up here where we have total PFAS content or load of about 40 to 50,000 PPT. Uh, from our 1313 tests on the soil alone. And when we added fluorosorb with 1% cement over here, 1, 3, and 5, we got to drop that all the way down to about 70 ppt. And when we tried it with 3% and 5%, really we got a little bit of variability here, but not as much. And uh, the interesting part that we found is that adding the 10% up to 10% uh, cement, uh, we have the 5%, the 3%, 10% here without any fluorosorb did not really do much for us. Actually, this one here gave us more than the soil alone. And part of that is P higher pH is mobilizing more PFAS and getting us more uh, 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 concentrations in, this, in the fluid, but it didn't really give us much help on its own, whereas adding 1% PFAS, regardless of the cement content, gave us much better results. We're going we're gonna to talk about this a little bit later as well in more details. But look at, let's look a little bit more about what's happening in those different eight groups of uh, analytes or constituents, since some of them are multiple analytes together, and see what's happening. So first, we're going to look at this, the, the group here with the PFPEAs uh, and um, again, we basically were seeing almost nothing with uh, most of our fluorosorbs, uh, the cement over here, the 1% cement dropped it a little bit, but then when you go to 3, 5, and 10% cement, actually the numbers bent back up, whereas when you add the fluorosorb, the numbers were uh, much lower. Uh, I for forgot to mention this, we actually did do one set of tests while we're doing this with actually filtrasorb 400, so the GAC. And um, we did that with 3% uh, 3 with 3% cement, so we can compare apples to apples for that one concentration. Um, and th so this was actually presented also as well over here uh, for the 3% uh, 
filter absorbed versus 3% three, three floor absorb over here, and you get relatively very comparable performance between the two. So anywhere here, you're going to see the blue lines are for the filter absorb. Next to it is the floor absorb at the same concentration of 3% and 3% OPC. Um, again, uh, cement alone uh, for the fossa was much higher than actually the soil alone. And uh, there's some other actually, there's cup, uh, same thing here at the 3% with the PFOA, we get higher. Even at the 10% here, we get higher. Um, and um, this is the second group here where you look at the PFBS. We're looking at the PFOS and so on. And remember to look at the PFHXS over here. And we'll still be able to reduce that on its own to below the 70 PPT with the different mixes. Uh, the cement alone did not really do much for us, but with the different percentages, we're able to do it. And that was our short carbon right here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later. There's a couple of analytes actually that we were not, uh, were not part of the eight, but when we added cement, then they popped up more. So we're going to present those in a minute later. But those to keep it with those eight that we, f we wanted to focus on initially. We did the 1316 with different L over S uh, ratios. We didn't really see much difference with the 10 versus that 5 and 2. Um, there wasn't anything to highlight any major uh, trends between, by changing L over S. Now, keeping in mind that we did stick to the L over S ratios that are in the current leaf procedures, which were not designed for PFAS testing. So maybe we should have went actually to higher L over S rather than going lower L over S than over the 10. Maybe we'd have seen differences, but at this point, since there's no actual procedures developed for PFAS, we felt that we should at least stick to the current procedures, and, uh, but we didn't really see anything different uh, between the different uh, L over S ratios, so we decided to combine all the data just because uh, our analytical testing, our results are reliable between within plus minus 30%, right? So when we get 100%, we could be anywhere between 70 and 130. So we figured the bigger the data set we have, the better off we are. So we combined the 1313, 1315 for our analysis. And I mentioned we're going to go back to the whole 32 analytes to look at some of the uh, ratios. And the main one you want to focus on is the red column over here. The red column is showing the ratio of the uh, concentration for with cement over the one without cement. So when you look at the numbers over here and you see a ratio of about 30, this means we get 30 times more leaching out when we added cement than what we, when we didn't have cement. And we only calculated those for, for any analyte that had at least 10 PPT detected in cement um, because some of them showed ridiculous ratios, but both numbers were so small that you really can't count on that ratios as much because of the uh, trust in those numbers when they get really below 10 PPT. So anything that you're seeing actually has a red bar here measured at least 10 PPT with cement, and then it was measuring less with others. So it was interesting to see that because, you know, taking us back to when we're talking about in-situ stabilization and our common, you guys made me start doing this also now. <laughs> uh, we, do we really need to add cement any, every time we're doing in-situ soil stabilization? And if we know it might be actually hurting us, do we want to add it? Right? So in some cases, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't help. But in, it looks like in some places, it might be hurting us. It might be mobilizing things that we don't, well, we're not going to be mobilized on their own. And so we should keep that in mind. And um, there might be different ways to get stabilized grouts to inject into the grout without adding cement. So maybe we should explore those kind of options when we're looking at applying it in the field. All right, so let's kind of recap everything and put it all in perspective. Uh, and what we're going to do is look at how the cement is affecting the performance compared to the fluorosorb. Uh, our soil is somewhere in the 40 to 50,000 PPT. For when we took look at the 
addition of the concentrations of all 32 analytes. And then what hap our health advisory is down here on the 70. We don't have our detection limits because we're adding everything up. It's not per analyte anymore. When we look at the cement alone with no fluorosorb, we have this nice optimal design here. And by optimal, I'm being very uh, optimal, right? Because it's still giving us almost the same amount of uh, PFAS in our effluent as if we didn't do any treatment. Um, but we, did, we do see that trend. And when we start adding, PFA, uh, start adding fluorosorb to our material, we guess what? That same trend shows up, but we're multiple order of magnitudes below. Uh, so what's, what this is telling us here is that at that same 5% OPC, we're getting the best performance with our 1% fluorosorb. Uh, we're still getting a little bit of benefit from the, th or a little bit of benefit at the five compared to the three and the ten. At the ten, we probably are the pH is too dominant compared to the three and the five. At the three, the the disadvantages of the extra mobilization is outdoing the advantage of some kind of stabilization from the cement, and we're getting that same kind of trend here with the one percent fluorosorb. When we look at the 3% fluorosorb, are the green dots here, is the, one, the blue dot here, really they kind of hard to dis distinguish the performance between the two. Um, then we looked at the 5%, we had 8% over here, the 5% fluorosorb down here, we got to a point where there's still a little bit of bias by the cement, but we kind of normalized it for the most part. If we still go back to the individual analytes, we still see some additional peaks in there, but when you look at the total PFAS, it's, we're getting a relatively consistent performance regardless of the uh, cement. So if you're at a site where you're asked to ha you'll have to add cement at some point, then maybe you'd think about, you know what, maybe I would go with a 5%. Maybe, I know that the 3% or the 1% might be enough, but then I'm going to get too much bias by the cement content. So if I go by 5%, then I can make on the spot decisions on how much cement I might need to add in one location versus the other and not worry about that additional cement might be impacting my overall performance in terms of uh, 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 leaching while I'm still getting the benefits in terms of strength and everything else. Um, so that 5% floor is we're going to keep in mind for a little bit later. Then we went and did the 1315. So the 1313 is kind of the aggressive method, trying to get everything out. 1315 is more of the diffusion transfer mechanism that we're trying to uh, model. So we're going to have, we have our um, uh, monolith out of the two by four. After 28 days, we have our um, tanks with the uh, reagent quality water. We're dipping this in, taking it out, dipping it in another one, and taking a sample of the water and analyzing it uh, um, for, what, for what leached out. Tests were done the two hours, 23, 23 hours, five days, seven, 14. So every time, this is the increment in which the, water st the specimen stayed in the water before being moved to a fresh container of water. Keep in mind, this is kind of an aggressive way of saying the water around the treated soil is changing all the time and creating maximum concentration gradient, if you want, between the uh, reagent quality water versus the treated soil. And this is some of the results we're getting from those tests. We're looking at the x-axis, we have the cumulative leaching time. On the y-axis, we have the cumulative mass transfer. And you'll see very distinct two groups. You have the groups with only cement up here. We have the groups down here with different concentrations of fluorosorb. The numbers we're looking at here are no longer PPT. Just keep that in mind. They're actually milligrams per meter square. It's a completely different uh, ball game. We're going to try to look at a better way to normalize those numbers so they can be a little bit more meaningful. Um, but obvious per difference in performance over here. You could look at those results and say down here, the 5% fluorosorb, 8% over PC is doing our best performance uh, because it's the lowest. You could make the argument that really this part over here, the 5% fluorosorb, 5% OPC, I would say is doing the best because it leveled out. 
which means that actually the amount of mastery, cumulative mass release is becoming constant over time, so that's better off. Yeah, this is a little bit uh, less at the, uh, lower at the beginning, but think about it. Before we went in and do the in-situ stabilization, that thing was occurring way up here. So if we reduced it down to here versus here short term, it's not making a big difference if we can get it to stop sooner. Um, another way to look at the data from the 1315 is looking at the flux, so the rate at which their things are going out, and again, your cement is up here, and your fluorosorb different mixes are over here. Uh, like I said, we're used to looking at PPT, and we know that 70 PPT that we want to reach are now going down to 20 or whatever it is and keeps changing, but how, what this nanogram per meter square means. Uh, so we try to look at the data in slightly different ways so we can make it more, uh, we can associate with it a little bit easier. So we took for the different tests how much the total amount of PFAS in nanograms that got actually transferred to the fluid and normalize that by the total mass of soil that was, the test was run on. So for the 1313 test, we had, let's say, 100 PPT. We had 400 milliliter of fluids. Multiply them by each other. We got the total in nanograms of PFAS in the, uh, that got out, normalize it by the 40 grams of the soil we put in, and we get now a concentration that's nanogram per gram of soil. And we could do the same for the 1315, and now we compare the results from both of them to see what those meters square per day over here really mean for us. And when we do that, uh, we get plots that shows, again, all of those are gonna be shifted by the exact amount because they all had the same specimen size, same amount of fluid, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on those plots, but this is, when we do the same thing for the this is, that looks the exact same plot that we had before for 1313, except now everything is presented in terms of nanograms per gram of soil. And we can present the data now from the 1315 with the nanograms per soil, and you know, that millions of nanograms per meter square reflect actually the same rough numbers as the 70 and 50 and 20 PPTs that we're getting from the 1313 when we're normalizing everything in terms of grams of soil that we actually are running our tests on. Okay? So we said we did compressive strength uh, as well as some hydraulic conductivity. This is looking at the compressive strength data over here with the different mixes that we had. Our soil was too too sandy to actually do any compressive strength on the natural soil itself, so you couldn't actually do that test. But, but we have the different mixes with the 1, 3, 5, 8, and 10 percent uh, OPC with the different fluorosorbs. And um, uh, you could see actually there's small increase in strength with increased percentage of fluorosorb, but there's much there. You could see the trends over here. Uh, there's within even within the same OPC, there's a little bit of increase as fluorosorb increases, uh, but you're not gonna be using fluorosorb to get more strength. That's not gonna be, that's gonna be a side benefit. You're not gonna design for that. Um, hydraulic conductivity, we still have limited data here, but we did a couple of tests with 8% fluorosorb, 3% OPC, and we get our hydraulic conductivity in 10 to power four, 10 to power five range. Then we did the one with 5% fluorosorb and 8% OPC and we're down to 10 to power minus nine. So if we're looking roughly somewhere in the middle here for the five and five, we're about 10 to power minus sevens, somewhere in that roughly, uh, considering that probably maybe the cement is the more prominent uh, factor in controlling the hydraulic conductivity than the fluorosorb itself. Uh, when it comes to hydraulic conductivity. Um, so, just some quick final thoughts on this. We noticed major drop in the effluent concentration with any percentage of fluorosorb that we added, and that's really good news, and it wasn't affected as much by OPC, although we did see at 1% fluorosorb, there's much more, a little bit more bias by OPC, uh, but still all within a small bandwidth in terms of the PPT we're getting. Uh, OPC alone was not a very effective way to 
stabilize our PFAS. And as a matter of fact, particularly for some of the FPBSs, FPFOS, and some others, it was, had a negative impact because it mobilized them more than when we had that we didn't have it. And we're, we haven't done the 1313 at high pH yet, but we're assuming that it's going to give up because of the high pH, we had more mobilization. So we'd expect to get similar numbers at the high pH that we really didn't get more mobilization. Because of the OPC, we got more mobilization of the higher pH. Um, and then when we're looking at, for this particular soil, right, don't take this recipe and use it for every site. <laughs> for this particular site, for this particular soil, we found that we could, get, we could use a 5% OPC and 5% fluorosorb if someone insisted that we need to have some minimal strength in there and we can't just go with fluorosorb if we're doing in-situ treatment, then going with a 5% and 5% would actually allow us to mitigate any negative impact we're gonna have from adding OPC. We're still gonna have the increase in strength, but we're still gonna be able to achieve the lowest uh, leachability from the soil, both from actually under the 1313 extreme case conditions or under that mass transfer from a 1315 kind of analysis. And that, I'd like to thank you all for your interest and time. Uh, I have my contact information here. I have to uh, thank um, the Coral School of Mine teams presented by Eric here for doing the analytical testing for us. Uh, Mike and John for all your support and uh, Setco Minerals Technology for the financial support, um, and uh, we mentioned Antonis at the beginning, we'd have to mention him at the end for all his uh, hard work in getting those tests done um, in a relatively short time, considering when we actually got, to st got the samples and got started on them. Um, and uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. So I don't know if you can jump back to slide 22. Of course. It's a, it's, it's a simple question. I, I think no. I know the answer, but. All right, so there's a, the activated carbon performed, you know, in very isolated circumstances far differently than the fluorosorb. And I just wonder if there was a theory behind that. I, I mean, obviously there's been shown on, on everybody's information that there's selectivity differences, but this seems really distinct. Well, I'm not a chemistry person, so I'm not going to get too much into the chemistry, but I'm going to take a general look at this. Whenever you're seeing those major selectivity and the numbers are around that 10 PPT, keep in mind that when the analytical testing, we stop losing too much trust in the data when we get to that range. So whether it's an 8 or a 12 or a 6 or a 5, you know, this is a log scale here, so those numbers are magnified, but they're still very small. So I'm not sure that I would put too much into this. At the end of the day, we are within plus minus 30% to start with. So anything within twice the magnitude, I would say they're the same to start with. So uh, we haven't actually looked at the particular, uh, particular analyze to see if they could look at the difference, but when you're looking at things like here, yeah, it's a factor of four or five, but they're all below six PPT, so I wouldn't put too much, bank too much onto that difference, just because of the low numbers. If both of those were up here between 1,000 and 4,000, or between, even between 100 and 400, then I would be much more focused on comparing them apples to apples, but being so low, I, I would not feel comfortable putting too much uh, uh, theory behind why the difference is coming from. But that would be just based on those numbers that would be my answer. Would the, regula Sorry. Would the regulations allow for any use of a very low unconfined compression strength type material in place of cement? I mean, as you know, Setco's we manufacture bentonite grouts, and we have a whole yeah. 
collection of them. Um, they could, they'd be neutral pH, they would have extremely low hydraulic permeabilities. Um, that might be something to look at. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, like we said, one of the things that we need to look at is we saw all this, but this is all lab simulated mixing. To be able to take this to the field, we have to go back and do a little bit more analysis on the rheology and the stability of the mix so that it can go through all your pumping lines, make it down, bypass the high pressures, and still deliver a uniform concentration of grout. There's nothing that we've seen here that tells us that we, it's not doable, but we'll still have to come up with the perfect mix to be able to do it. And that's gonna require some additives to stabilize the mix, and that additives could be partly based on cement, but could be also partly based on bentonite and other additives. And I don't make decisions for regula regulations on terms of really needing that strength in there, uh, but the bottom line from where I look at it as a geotechnical engineers, if we're not, if we can achieve the same strength that was there in the ground before, for whatever the soil is under that effective stresses in the ground, we don't need to go even 5% higher than that because things were good as they are. We're not having failures there. Why would should we go from, this is, a gra this is a sandy material for instance, right? We couldn't actually get one PSI out of this if we were to test it in the lab. And it was in the ground and there was no failures occurring. Why suddenly now I have to take it up to 50 PSI just because I'm treating it? I just need to take it back to what it used to be and making sure that I did not reduce the strength and that should be good enough. Other questions? All right, well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>